starting or i should start the wait 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 for some time it is connecting Can start. Yeah, welcome, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, yeah, Academy of Echo webinar. And, uh, today we will be speaking uh, with our speakers who would be detailing about uh, matter regurgitation assessment, and uh, it would be the tips and tricks to how to, to uh, have a better assessment of the matter map, both of transthoracic and trans echo and uh, transthoracic echo, and at the same time. We have a 3D assessment also of matter regurgitation. Uh, I would invite uh, Dr. Hardeep Kaurgirwal and Dr. Sunil Bora to speak on their respective topics. Uh, let me first invite Dr. Hardeep Kaurgirwal. She will be speaking on the 3D assessment of uh, matter regurgitation. Yes. That's Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, can I share my screen now? Please. Yes. yes. Is it visible now? Yes, it is visible now. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so today I'll be talking about 3D imaging of the mitral valve. So uh, as we all know that uh, 3D echo is uh, is a useful modality and has been in use for almost a decade now. And uh, there are many clinical scenarios where 3D echo uh, uh, is indicated, especially for the quantification of uh, cardiac chambers, and even the guidelines recommend that. Another uh, clinical scenario which uh, where 3D echo has been extremely useful is when we want to make an assessment of a structural abnormality, and one such structure is mitral valve, where 3D uh, echo has been used increasingly, and it has become an integral part of uh, various surgical and percutaneous mitral valve interventions. Now, um, mitral valve uh, assessment by T uh, give, gives us very good uh, good quality images, and because uh, good quality images is, is a kind of prerequisite for uh, for good quality three D images, so that is why um, the mitral valve assessment using three D T is used very frequently. Now, why we get uh, good quality mitral valve? images when we use T, the reason is that, um, as we can see in this picture, that this is the esophagus and uh, here is the transducer. And we can see that the, uh, unlike in transthoracic echo, where the uh, transducer is here, um, the uh, when we use, um, uh, when uh, in T, the, uh, the uh, ultrasound beam is uh, emitted from the transducer uh, and the structures which are scanned first are the posterior cardiac structures. So the uh, posterior cardiac structures, they are in the near field of the ultrasound beam. And uh, those structures are like mitral valve, left atrium and left atrial appendage. And that is why we get very good quality images when we do uh, when we use T for mitral valve imaging. Um, and uh, when we combine three, uh, um, the the T assessment with 3D, uh, that uh, that becomes an extremely important and useful modality, uh, not just in identifying the pathology, but in various interventions as well. So um, before we uh, discuss further, uh, I uh, uh, I think. Uh, 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 I would like to revise the mitral valve anatomy first. Mitral valve anatomy is quite complex. Um, there are uh, various uh, structures in the mitral valve apparatus. There is um, mitral annulus, then there is uh, interior mitral leaflet, posterior mitral leaflet, and which are uh, connected to the pap muscles through the cordy tendony. And then these pap muscles, they are part of uh, LV myocardium. So LV myocardial abnormalities can also affect the mitral valve uh, functioning. Um, 
Now here we can see that the, that the mitral annulus is a saddle shaped structure with the interior part of the mitral annulus and posterior part of the mitral annulus, which is important for the mitral valve cooptation. And these three views, they uh, are, uh, are showing the mitral valve the way it is seen in, uh, um, uh, it is seen from the surgeon's perspective, the way they are, the mitral valve is seen from the LA side. Uh, now in this image, we can see that, uh, now this is the mitral valve and here is the aorta so we can see that the AML has uh, is is larger than PML and and is is adjacent to the intervalvular fibrosa and PML although it is shorter but it has uh, the circumference uh, circumferential attachment to the annulus is much more than uh, that of interior mitral leaflet and on the uh, lateral side there is left atrial appendage so this is how the uh, uh, the the image is also oriented when we do 3D and now these two uh, here we can see that uh, the the, uh, the this is how the mitral valve is seen from the left atrial side that um, inherently posterior mitral leaflet is um, uh, has indentations and uh, so we're, with uh, and uh, PML can be divided into three parts on the basis of these indentations. Um, and although AML surface, the left atrial surface is quite smooth, but corresponding to the uh, PML scallops, a interior mitral leaflet can also be divided into scallops. So P1, A1, and P2, A2, and P3, A3. And this is the cooptation line. We can see that the cooptation line is U shaped. So, um, when we do uh, 3D um, uh, assessment and when we do 3D imaging, that's how we try to uh, orient the image uh, the way it will be seen from the surgeon's perspective. Um, uh, so here you can see that this is the mitral valve, aortic valve at the top, left atrial appendage at nine o'clock position. And this is the AML and this is the PML and this is the intraatrial septum. So uh, before we uh, discuss about the pathologies, uh, uh, I would like to discuss a little bit about how to acquire 3D image of the mitral valve. So first step is um, to make a to make a proper image where the mitral valve is seen properly. Now. Uh, as far as T is concerned, any T view can be used. You can use Mitisif visual four chamber view or bicommissural view or 90 degree or 120 degree. But we recommend that the fir first view which we should be aiming for should be the bicommissural view. Um, now, once you will make this bicommissural view, next step is that now, since we are interested in only in the mitral valve, so the so we won't be using full volume here. We will be using 4D zoom here, right? So once you have made this view, the next step is to press on 4D zoom. And when you will press on 4D zoom, the on the on your machine on this uh, on the screen, the uh, there will be uh, this is your primary view which you make, and there will be an orthogonal view um, that is your secondary image. And on and here there will be like two sectors. Now, before I discuss further, I would like to emphasize that why we think that biocommissure view uh, should be the starting view. The reason is that when we make biocommissure view, it gives us a, a medial to lateral orientation of the mitral valve. And uh, the orthogonal image which you get when you make biocommissure view gives us the anterior to put anterior to posterior orientation of the mitral valve. Now, this is very important because as I said, that we have to align the mitral valve in a way that it is that it should appear as if it is seen from the surgeon's perspective. So it becomes important because aorta here is an important landmark, uh, which would automatically appear in the orthogonal view if you make biocommissural view as your primary image. So let's go back. So uh, once you have made, uh, you, you press 4D zoom, the, uh, on the screen you would see two images, biocommissure view as your primary image, and this is your orthogonal image. And on top of that, there, you can see that there are these two sectors. Now, basically we have to adjust the width and the depth of the sectors in a way that the mitral valve should be fully included in these sectors, right? If, um, both in systole as well, in, uh, as, well as in diastole. Right now, and another important thing that in this particular view, we have to adjust the sector in a way that not just that the mitral valve should be within the sector, but also the aortic valve. As I said, that the aortic valve is an important landmark in orienting the 3D image. So, 
So once you have adjusted the sectors, so here we have adjusted the sectors and we can see the whole of the mitral valve within, is within the sector and here the aortic valve is also within the sector along with the mitral valve. Now, once this is done, then you will press the 4D um, button again. And when you will press the 4D button again and uh, the, your uh, machine display would show this, this is your primary image which you made and this is the orthogonal view. Now, this arrow indicates that you are seeing the mitral valve from the left atrial side. And this is the 3D data set which appears. Now, different machines would give, diff, uh, would the orientation of the 3D data set would be different in different machines. And this is how the image is displayed when we use GE machine. Now, here, if I try to understand this 3D image, now you can see that, as I said, that this is the biochemistry view and the orientation is from medial to lateral. So which means that the structures which are seen on this side of the 3D image are medial structures and structures on this side are lateral structures. And now this image gives us anteroposterior orientation. So which means that on 3D uh, data set, the anterior structures are displayed below and the posterior structures are displayed above. So as we have just discussed that we want to orient the image in a way that the aorta should be at top. So what we need to do is that we would just rotate the image. And once we have rotated the image, you will get image like this, that the aorta would come at the top and the leaflet, which is adjacent to the aorta is AML. The other one is the PML. And on the side is the left atrial appendage. And then you can easily mark the, um, the scallops. That is, this would be the anterolateral commissure. This would be the posterior medial commissure. And this would be A1, A2, and A3. This would be P1, P2, and P3. So uh, if you put color Doppler, then also you would be able to uh, ha have information regarding then from which point the mitral regurgitation is appearing. So uh, I would uh, like to share an example here, uh, emphasizing uh, the importance of 3D uh, mitral valve assessment. So this is mid-esophageal four-chamber view. And here we can see that there is some prolapse of the AML. And we know that in four-chamber view, we see A2 and P2, right? Um, now, uh, this is uh, another, uh, so when we put color, and we could see that, uh, just give me a second. So when we put color here, we can see that the, th there is a mitral regurgitation, but the, uh, the, the origin of the mitral regurgitation jet is not that clear here. So this is by commissural view. And here we can see this is uh, your P1, this is A2, and this is P3. And again, we can see that the A2 is, uh, uh, is prolapsing into the left atrium. Uh, now, when we put color in the bicommissural view, we can see that, that there is mitral regurgitation. But if it is only A2 prolapse, then you would expect the central jet. But here, the jet is eccentric, right? So uh, earlier, we were thinking that this is A2 prolapse. But here, I have my doubts that maybe there is uh, some other segment is also prolapsing. Now, here, you can see that um, this is the uh, 90 degrees uh, mid-esophageal two-chamber view. And in this view, we uh, see the P3 and A3 scallop. And here we can see that the, this probably A3 is also prolapsing into the left atrial cavity. And uh, here the, you can clearly see the mitral regurgitation jet and the origin is also very clear, right? So this is your um, um, apical um, long axis view where um, we usually see um, P2 and A2, and we can see that A2 is prolapsing. Now, when we are using just 2D, we get a uh, with comprehensive assessment, with thorough assessment, we, we, we get a very good idea that which uh, leaflet might be prolapsing. But sometimes it becomes very confusing, as in this case, that whether A2 is prolapsing or A3 is prolapsing or both leaflets are prolapsing. Now, if I use uh, 3D here, now, so using the same principles which we have just discussed, here, this is the aorta, this is the left atrial appendage, and this is AML, and this is PML. And we can see that there is a predominant uh, prolapse of A3 scallop. There is some prolapse of A2 also, but A3 is the predominant pathology. So, uh, so 
in this way, using 3D, we can assess the pathologies. Um, I mean, it, it becomes uh, slightly easier and less of imagination in comparison to 2D alone. As in this picture, we can see that in the first picture, we can see that there is A1 and P1, both leaflets are prolapsing. And um, in the second picture, we can see that A2 is prolapsing. This is A2 prolapse. And here we can see that the, the A3 scallop is flail. And similarly, in this picture, we can appreciate um, similarly, in this picture, we can appreciate uh, that I'm sorry, this is not working, but there is P1 uh, perforation uh, could be seen in this picture. Now here we can see that the P2 is prolapsing very clearly, and here we can see that the, the P3 scallop is frail. So that is why. Uh, so uh, so this this example is showing that how uh, 3D imaging uh, can help in 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 making the diagnosis and in identifying the pathology. So uh, another uh, case which I would like to show, uh, now this patient was referred to us for, uh, for evaluation before mitra clip. Um, uh, so we did T as a part of evaluation for mitra clip and the patient was referred to us with the diagnosis of uh, secondary mitral regurgitation. And in this image, this is mid-esophageal four chamber view and we can see there is denting of the mitral leaflets. And then in this image, there is mitral regurgitation. This is this long axis mid esophageal view. Um, yes, you can appreciate that there is tenting of the mitral leaflets here. And then um, here you can see that um, the, the mitral regurgitation is severe. Now, when we used uh, 3D images, though till now we were thinking that this is uh, secondary mitral regurgitation, and using 3D um, showed us that uh, this patient has cleft mitral, uh, posterior mitral leaflet cleft and uh, the MR is also coming from there. Now, this information is very important and relevant because uh, just um, because we were thinking that probably this patient is a good candidate for mitra clip, but using 3D showed us that it's a, it's a cleft and cleft PML, not that mitra clip cannot be done, but it is technically very challenging and needs a lot of expertise. So this information is very important. Um, <clears throat> Now, um, so so far we have discussed that the 3D echo is important in the mitral valve pathology assessment. But in the current area where current era where the structural heart interventions are coming up, uh, so 3D is uh, is increasingly used in that. And one of the best example where 3D um, is used and the, the procedure which just is just cannot be done without T guidance. And 3D is extremely helpful in that is the mitral clip procedure. Now here we can see that um, now this is the device which is used uh, to treat um, degenerative uh, and uh, secondary MR. Um, now, uh, what happens in this uh, procedure that uh, uh, this is this is a kind of clip, and the uh, the success of uh, of this procedure depends that how well this uh, um, this clip is or is aligned and oriented in relation to the mitral pathology, and this alignment of the clip and to, to ensure that the clip is properly oriented in relation to the mitral is uh, is ensured with the help of 3D TE. So um, now again, uh, when we do mitral clip. We make these two views as we discussed earlier. Now, this is the biochemistry view. This view is important to align the clip directly over the uh, over the uh, over the mitral pathology, and uh, corresponding view is the um, long axis of the um, uh, mid-esophageal long axis, which shows us the anteroposterior orientation. Now, this particular view is important because uh, once you have uh, once you you um, uh, you find out that this is the pathology this is the site of the pathology and this is the point where my clip should be pointing towards now this view would tell us that your clip should not be too anterior and it should not be too posterior so these two views we use now and you would say that the, we, we are not really using any 3d image in this but we are using x plane we are using two orthogonal planes and which is possible only with the use of 3d transducer now, uh, once you have uh, ensured that your clip is right at the position of the mitral valve uh, pathology, um, then the next step is 
that uh, you would uh, ensure the orientation of the clip. Now, the clip should be oriented in a way that it should be perpendicular to the line of cooptation, right? So uh, uh, I will show you this example. So in this example, you can see that the clip is oblique. This is if this is the line of cooptation. This clip is like this. Now with the, with three D imaging, we have to ensure that by just um, uh, by uh, we have to ensure that the clip is perpendicular. And now after um, changing the orientation, here we can in this view we can see that the clip is perpendicular to the cooptation line. So uh, once uh, uh, once you have ensured that. Uh, the, that the clip is oriented uh, properly. The next step is, uh, is is leaflet grasping. So what you have to do that you advance the uh, clip into the left ventricle, and then the clip is slowly withdrawn. And once you uh, ensure that the leaflets are lying, um, uh, once you ensure that the leaflets are. Um, um, uh, are lying over the uh, clips, then you, here you can see that once you are happy with this orientation, that the clip is perpendicular to the cooptation line and the leaflets and both leaflets are lying, uh, are falling on the clips, then you grasp it as you, uh, and once you, uh, this is done, then you, by putting color, you ensure that there is, um, that whether the mitral regurgitation has resolved or not, whether the clip position is stable or not, and, uh, and then you check the gradients across the mitral valve. So um, here in this image, you can see that there's a good tissue bridge and the mitral valve orifice is now by orifice. So, so not just that uh, the 3D helped in identifying the exact pathology, identifying the exact scallop, but also in the intraprocedural guidance, it has being used. So <clears throat> another such procedure is uh, transmitral valvular replacement. Now in team, TMVR, 3D, use of 3D is not really essential, but if it is there, if we have that modality, then we can use it to, uh, to guide the, uh, to, uh, for guiding the uh, catheter uh, when it crosses the uh, prostatic heart valve. Now, uh, there is another procedure that is lampoon procedure. Now, when we are doing TMVR, especially in native valves, sometimes there is risk of LVOT obstruction. So when there is a, when that thing is anticipated that LVOT might get obstructed because of the AML, then uh, what they do in lampoon that they lacerate the AML uh, to prevent that LVOD obstruction. And this procedure is also highly um, uh, T uh, dependent and 3DT is very helpful in this procedure as well. So another procedure <clears throat> where um, 3D is helpful is in the closure of um, uh, para, uh, in the closure of um, paravalvular leaks. Now, uh, this is an example. So this is midisophageal five chamber view, and we can see there is a bioprostatic valve at mitral position, and there is a paravalvular regurgitant jet. Now, in this particular view, we are not sure that from where it is coming, if we look from the LA side. So uh, probably this is at nine o'clock position, although the origin is not very clear. Now, in this image, I can see in the second image. Now, this, <clears throat> this is the four chamber view. And uh, so, again, I'm not very sure about the, um, about the origin of the jet. So this is the uh, midisophageal uh, four chamber view at zero degree. And I can see that there is a paravalvular jet and uh, this is probably at three o'clock position. And uh, this is a two chamber view at 90 degrees. And there is, again, I can see that there is a paravalvular jet here and uh, which is at six o'clock position. Now, when we are using uh, um, um, 2D assessment for to find out that how many paravalvular leaks are there and at what position they are coming from. We are using a lot of imagination and there's a lot of mental reconstruction in our mind that from where it is coming, probably there are two jets, probably uh, one jet is coming from three o'clock or nine o'clock or six o'clock, but we are not 100% sure of that. And we have to be very sure when we are sending this patient for PVL device closure. Now, uh, this is the 3D image, and when we put color, it is quite clear 
that there are two paravalvular leaks, one at six o'clock position, which is a bigger leak, and one at um, uh, three o'clock position, which is a smaller leak. So, so there's no imagination now. Everything is right in front of us. And not just in identifying the number of leaks or the position of leaks, it is also helpful in guiding the procedure throughout in crossing the catheter that it should not be cross that it should be crossing through the defect which we want to uh, uh, want to close. Um, and um, then uh, here in this particular patient, you can see that uh, with the help of 3D TE, um, two devices were deployed and uh, with very good results. Now, not just uh, uh, there's another uh, indication for which 3D can be used for mitral valve assessment is mitral valve quantification. Now, this is not done very routinely, but now with the advent of new uh, devices, new mitral valve uh, repair devices and newer mitral valve repair techniques, uh, we need to have this information that what is the size of the mitral annulus, what is the tenting height, tenting volume, what is the length of the mitral leaflets. Now. Uh, so we have so once you have acquired the images on uh, <clears throat> and so you this is like your primary image and this is the orthogonal view there is a dedicated tool to assess mitral uh, to to do the mitral valve quantification so we have if you go to in the controls if you go to measure there is a tool called mvq on g which is mitral valve quantification and when you press on that uh, you will get uh, these kind of images and here there is a cartoon uh, on the uh, on the uh, upper end which will tell us that how to align these views so there should be one line which is parallel to the mitral annulus and another line which is perpendicular to the competition point. And this is how once you have aligned the views and um, then you set the landmarks as prompted by the software. And um, with that, like within a minute, you will get all the information regarding the, um, uh, the, uh, the annular diameter, annular area, AB diameter, and uh, <clears throat> the leaflet length and in the form of a table it will give you all of the information like this so it is very useful although not done very routinely mostly during re for research purposes but i think now especially like when the patient is going for the mitral repair uh, for patients in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where a uh, patient has to go for a myomectomy and there's a plus minus um, plan to do mitral repair as well i think these this information, the length of the AML, this, this is very important. Um, now, so far we have discussed just about uh, <clears throat> the use of 3D in TEE, but uh, there are certain, uh, uh, there are a few scenarios where, um, uh, where transthoracic echo can also be very useful uh, for mitral valve assessment using 3D. And one such scenario is rheumatic mitral stenosis, where we want to be sure that we are, um, we want to measure the my accurate mitral valve area by planimetry. So by using the, um, the, the 3D, transducer by using different planes um, we can be we can ensure that we are cutting through the tips of the mitral leaflets and uh, so this is what we do this is the uh, transthoracic parasternal long axis view uh, and uh, this is your primary view and when you press 4d zoom you will get the orthogonal picture the secondary image and you will get a, a 3d image now, next step, when you want to calculate the mitral valve area, the next step is to press on flexi view or uh, flexi slice on G or multi view on um, on uh, on Philips machine. So when you press flexi slice, what happens that you will get these uh, three orthogonal planes and these are um, grid lines showing different planes. Now, this plane shows that uh, the mitral valve is in the short axis, right? Now, if I move this white plane and bring it at the tip of the mitral valve leaflets, I can um, uh, I can uh, make sure that 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 the plane is cutting through the tip of the mitral valve leaflets and not beyond it. So, what you have to do that you have to adjust these planes uh, as I've seen done in this picture. So after adjusting the plane, bringing the white plane at the tip and bringing the green plane through the cooptation point uh, in this picture, as well as in this picture, we can see that the uh, that now you can see the very um, good mitral valve opening. And uh, we are sure that this plane is cutting through the mitral valve leaflet tips. 
now in 3d image is also showing the same but when you do when you have to do a mitral planimetry we will be using this image and not uh, the 3d image we will be using 2d image so um so this is about uh, um the uh, the overall uh, um uh, um overview of use of 3d in mitral valve assessment so because uh, we get very good uh, mitral valve images through te so using 3d it, it it has become very important it has become an integral part of various st structural art intervention uh, especially uh, the percutaneous ones so but i i believe that uh, that 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 there is a learning curve to it so um so the whole idea was to uh, was to give an idea that uh, that how this can be used and um, uh, um uh, and not 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 just in the uh, in in t even in transthoracic echo we can use 3d like as i said that in rheumatic myelitis thank you thank you hardeep thank you for the Beautiful uh, representation of 3D uh, echo of in assessment of mitral valve regurgitation. So till now we have seen what is the role of 3D echo, and we can clearly see that it gives us uh, detailed and ana anatomical characteristics of mitral valve morphology, precise quantification of regurgitation, and also tells us about the mechanism of mitral valve uh, disease. So basically, this will help us in assessing the severity of the disease and also tell us the appropriate timing of treatment, what treatment we can offer and what should be the accurate timing of the treatment. So we have seen uh, uh, the anatomical description. We've seen how the new technology has helped us in uh, helping our intervention colleagues regarding the mitral clip technique and also the uh, replacement of the valve and uh, trans mitral uh, replacement so uh, i think then we can go on to the next one then dr uh, dr bora will be will be uh, talking to us about tips to improve the uh, accuracy of mitral valve regurgitation assessment and uh, for the people who are uh, following us on youtube all the information regarding the ie and the seminars is displayed in the description below the youtube uh, videos and uh, normally these this is a second seminar in the series of uh, uh, initiative taken by ie for the uh, webinars and um, normally we try to conduct it on the third wednesday of the month but due to diwali this was postponed to the fourth wednesday the recording will be available on the youtube and people who've not been able to join can view it later on so now I pass on the voting to Dr. Sunil Bora, who will be talking about tips to improve accuracy of MR assessment. Thank you, uh, and thank you uh, to Indian Academy for giving us opportunity to share our knowledge. I'll be speaking about the tips to improve the accuracy of MR assessment. So, uh, actually, quantification of MR severity is very important for uh, decisions regarding the uh, surgery, the need for the surgery for these patients, whether it is mitral valve repair or replacement. And also, those patients are not going for surgery to predict their risk and uh, prognosis. So, the pathway for MR assessment, the recent uh, focus update of uh, 2017 uh, ACC expert consensus uh, decision pathway on the management of uh, MR, very clearly they have laid out uh, the flow of. Uh, uh, evaluation of these patients. So, so as you can see, uh, it, it involves the role of the primary care provider uh, and the clinical uh, cardiologist to identify the symptoms of MR and uh, the clinical context, uh, and then moving on to the evaluation by transfer as echo by the imaging expert, wherein we look at the etiology, whether it is uh, primary uh, uh, mitral regurgitation or secondary, or there is mixed etiology. So once uh, we have identified that, uh, then we can, uh, uh, the imaging expert can go ahead and do the uh, severity assessment uh, with the use of various tools, which I will be discussing in the future uh, uh, in the further slides, uh, whether it's because uh, through quantification, through uh, other uh, means, and then to uh, definitely very clearly we can quantify whether it's mild, moderate, or severe mitral regurgitation. So before we actually start, we should uh, be aware that the uh, uh, mitral valve anatomy is a very complex structure. It involves, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Hardeep has already said, uh, mitral annulus, uh, the leaflets, there could be pathology in the caudate tendine, the papillary muscles, the posterior LA wall, and also the 
LV free wall and the papillary muscle which is attached to it. So the etiology of MR primary uh, MR is defined by the principal involvement of the leaflets and or cordae uh, tendine in the pathological process. It could be because of myxomatous disease or endocarditis. Secondary MR is characterized by incompetence due to the adverse changes in the LV size, shape or function with or without annular dilatation. The classical example being ischemic cardiomyopathy. And mixed MR is due to both primary and secondary causes. Like for example, a patient who has already had mitral valve prolapse and ends up with an ischemic cardiomyopathy can have both the causes. Pathophysiology, the carpenter classification very clearly, it identifies uh, whether it's type 1, type 2 or type 3, wherein type 1 is uh, the MR with normal leaflet motion, uh, like example, annular dilatation and leaflet perforation. Type 2 is uh, due to the leaflet increased leaflet motion in the form of uh, the caudal rupture or the caudal elongation, papillary muscle elongation or rupture. Type 3 is with restricted leaflet motion, usually due to fibrosis of the cerebral uh, apparatus or due to the regional wall motion abnormality. So before we actually uh, progress on to the evaluation, I just want to spend two, three slides on very, very important things like the clinical features, which we need to keep in mind, the symptoms and signs of mitral regurgitation. The patient can come with fatigue, dyspnea, or topnea or palpitation, or can come in the form of complications uh, involving the left ventricular volume overload or uh, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary edema, uh, especially in um, acute mitral regurgitation congestive heart failure and uh, the complications of embolization. Uh, auscultation, very clear. We need to uh, keep in mind uh, the holosystolic murmur we can hear. Please look at the ECG uh, for subtle changes like left atrial enlargement or left atrial hypertrophy, presence of atrial fibrillation, and also the X-ray uh, in the form of cardiomegaly, especially the uh, double atrial shadow. So coming actually to the evaluation of a patient with MR, we must take into account the clinical context. Uh, we should uh, not forget to uh, record the systemic blood pressure, look at the heart rate, look at the valve anatomy, the LV size function, the LA size and uh, volume, pulmonary heart hypertension, and please look at the uh, uh, whether the patient is on uh, the guideline directed management uh, and the intensity of the treatment. So my talk is based on uh, the recommendations from the non-invasive uh, evaluation of native alveolar exudation, uh, the JS, uh, the American Asso Society of Electrocardiography Guidelines. I'll not go into the details, but uh, just uh, to make uh, uh, a very uh, overview, we need to look at uh, structural abnormalities of the mitral valve, look at the LV and the LA size, go on to uh, uh, do the qualitative uh, doctor evaluation, whether it's uh, 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 the color flow jet area or the flow convergence by PISA, the color, uh, uh, the continuous wave Doppler. Also look at the semi-quantitative assessment uh, of uh, the vena contractor with pulmonary vein flow, don't forget to uh, measure it, and then look at the mitral inflow pattern. And uh, to go more further, we can use the PISA to uh, calculate the effective regurgitant orifice area, the regurgitant volume, and the regurgitant fraction. So I'll uh, just go through this uh, through various examples. My first case, uh, a 50 year old male, a known case of mitral valve disease, uh, which uh, he had dyspnea of an existence since five years, which are gradually progressive. And he had a fall and uh, sustained uh, no fractures, but then he developed acute worsening breathlessness and palpitations in the last three days. On examination, his heart rate was 107. He was hemodynamically stable. This was his echo, the transthoracic echo. Very clearly, uh, you can see there is a uh, myxomatous mitral valve changes, but then there is some caudal uh, rupture uh, uh, seen uh, there. And uh, going on to the color, uh, uh, not very, very clearly, we can see the jet here, probably because this is an eccentric jet, but then you can see the uh, uh, the flow convergence, which is happening, the PISA radius, even without uh, uh, shifting the baseline, you can see that uh, the there is a good um, flow convergence seen there. And when we, uh, 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 we can go ahead and do the evaluation of uh, the MR quantification by PISA, here we calculated uh, the radius and the vena contracta was uh, six millimeters. You can see the mitral inflow pattern. It is E-dominant uh, with a uh, E-velocity of more than 1.2. Uh, the, the continuous uh, wave uh, MR jet very clearly shows early peaking and very high gradient. So the MR evaluation by color flow Doppler using the PISA is very, very, uh, uh, it looks very complex, but then uh, if you start doing it on a regular basis, it becomes easy. Uh, so it's uh, the steps involved here is we uh, need to put the color flow, zoom out on the mitral valve and uh, look at the flow convergence uh, happening uh, at the mitral valve uh, orifice. 
then what you need to do is you need to shift the baseline uh, uh, down so that you get a good trapezoidal uh, radius. And after that, you measure the radius and then also measure the peak uh, MR velocity. So if you have these measurements, then you can calculate the regurgitant uh, uh, the yeah, uh, flow, which is given by two uh, two pi r squared into the aliasing velocity, which gives us the the effective regurgitant orifice area when we divide by the um, the peak. Uh, sorry, uh, this is the the aliasing velocity, and then when we divide the regurgitant flow by the peak gradient, we get the effective regurgitant orifice area. So when it is less than 0.2 centimeter square, it is mild, and if it is more than 0.4, it is severe. So in our patient, it turned out to be uh, the effective regurgitant orifice area was uh, almost 40 uh, centimeters uh, squared, and the regurgitant volume was 60 ml per beat. So uh, very clearly, our patient fits into this uh, severe, but then not all the uh, parameters uh, are fitting in, but at least three out of four, if they are fitting into the uh, uh, guidelines, then uh, we can take that uh, value. So this case demonstrates very classical quantitative assessment of the MR severity by PISA. But however, this method needs good echo images, a systematic evaluation by various measurements, and then I make uh, 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 remember that practice makes one perfect. So I see a lot of sonographers, a lot of echo uh, echocardiographers who are not very comfortable with doing the PISA evaluation because they're not used to it. You need to make sure that you do it regularly. So coming to my next case. Uh, the 64 year old uh, with uh, tiredness and the shortness of breath, easy fatigability, is a known diabetic and hypertensive, uh, had had history of ISD with old antiviral MI post PDCA to LAD. When, he, uh, when we examined his heart, it was 80, blood pressure was 150 by 90, his body surface area was 1.6 uh, meters squared. And these are the uh, trans uh, thoracic uh, echo images. Here you can see very clearly there is regional wall motion abnormality, the mitral valve is not opening uh, very well, and the coaptation uh, uh, is also not uh, happening nicely. Uh, this is a short axis view, and you can see the mitral flow uh, not very, very clearly uh, uh, vi visible here. So here the tip is you need to do a lot of adjustments, a lot of color gain adjustments is required. You need to concentrate probably reduce the sector width and concentrate on the uh, mitral regurgitation, and then maybe you can just uh, tilt the probe or see where you can get a good uh, 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 jet. Uh, so these are all very, very simple uh, things, uh, but important tips what uh, we need to do to improve our accurate, uh, accuracy in the evaluation of the mitral regurgitation. Uh, the four chamber view also very clearly uh, uh, shows uh, left, uh, the wall motion abnormality and uh, dilated LA and LV, but then on putting color, not very sure whether it is a mild MR or moderate MR or severe MR because the color flow is not there. So one of the reasons could be because of the LV dysfunction wherein the, the force uh, of mitral regurgitation is less, but definitely it looks mild here. And uh, to add on to that, the mitral inflow pattern is uh, uh, A dominant here. So when you uh, just uh, tilt the probe and little and then try to Trace the uh, MR jet, you can see that it is looking more uh, better in this view and uh, probably it is moderate uh, with the uh, continuous flow uh, Doppler uh, definitely showing uh, early peaking here. So it, it's very confusing. So this is a case which we see day in and out wherein some features are looking mild, some features are looking like moderate or severe. So we need to accurately uh, 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 quantify it so that we can uh, uh, do the prognostication of this patient and then also optimize the medical treatment uh, so that uh, his uh, dyspnea is taken care of. So uh, the question here is how do we assess the severity of uh, uh, the MRJ, whether it's mild, moderate, severe, or whether we are not able to assess and then we need to do further uh, this one. So uh, here uh, the trans thoracic echo definitely showed that LV was a uh, little dilated. LA is definitely dilated with a left atrial volume index uh, of 38 uh, ml per meter squared. The color flow and the continuous flow Doppler jet uh, showed maybe mild, moderate, not very conclusive. Again, because of the LV dysfunction, it's been very difficult to tell. And uh, the pulse wave Doppler across the mitral valve was eight dominant, which excludes a severe MR. So let's look at the algorithm. Uh, what does it say in the guidelines? Uh, here, uh, very clearly, uh, this is a guideline document. Very clearly, it uh, uh, specifies how to go about when we look at the uh, 
patient with chronic mitral regurgitation by Doppler echocardiography. So mind you here, uh, the caution for color is that all values for the effective regurgitant orifice area by PSA, they assume that there is a holosystolic MR and only uh, a single frame EROA by PSA or vena contractor width and uh, the vena contractor area, uh, they overestimate the non holodiastolic uh, uh, MR. So we have to be very careful. So our patient, uh, the mitral A, wave dominant uh, inflow was there. The, there was almost a normal or a mildly dilated LV. So here, uh, 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 with this intermediate values, uh, so the MR probably was moderate. Uh, so according to the uh, gross estimate or, or uh, the eyeball uh, uh, estimate. So we need to perform quantitative measurements or uh, methods whenever possible. And uh, I tell you how to do that. So. In our patient, the LA is dilated, but the color Doppler is inconclusive. The pulse wave Doppler is showing that it is mild. So with mixed signs, it is advisable to quantitate the regurgitant volume and the fraction. So the regurgitant volume, how can we do the, uh, what is regurgitant volume? It is the volume of blood that regurgitates through an incompetent valve. So how do we uh, calculate is uh, by uh, measuring the stroke volume across the mitral valve and then uh, subtracting that from the uh, stroke volume across uh, the competent valve that is aortic uh, valve, uh, provided there is no significant stenosis or regurgitation. And uh, the regurgitant fraction we can calculate by uh, dividing the regurgitant volume divided by the uh, stroke volume across the regurgitant or the incompetent valve. So how do we calculate the mitral valve stroke volume? So here it's very, very important. How do we do the method of calculation is very, very important. Make sure that you keep the mitral valve open just uh, before the atrial contraction. Okay, so, and then you measure the annulus from the inner diameter uh, uh, to the inner uh, diameter. So here we have calculated this 2.9. And then when you're taking the uh, mitral valve uh, Doppler, you need make sure that you place the sample volume at this place and not at the tip of the mitral valve leaflet. So you should make sure that you keep the sample volume at the uh, uh, mitral annulus where you're going to measure the mitral annulus in the four chamber view. And once we have done that, we get this uh, Doppler pattern and then we trace it and then uh, we uh, get the uh, VTI across uh, uh, the uh, mitral valve. So uh, uh, by using the uh, formula to pi r squared into the VTI, we get the stroke volume across the mitral valve. So here it is 112. So similarly, we calculate the stroke volume across the aortic valve, which is a competent valve here. Again, we require two measurements, the LVOT, uh, make sure that again, you keep the mitral, uh, the aortic valve open and then you, uh, you measure the LVOT. And uh, trace the, uh, uh, you, again, uh, you need to place the sample volume in the LVOT in the five chamber view, take this tracing and then trace it and we get the VTI. Then we calculate the LVOT stroke volume. This is 88 ml. So the mitral valve stroke volume in this patient was 112. The LVOT stroke volume was 88. The regurgitant volume was only 24 and the regurgitant fraction was only 21%. So all these values fit into a mild MR. So remember we had the confusion whether it's mild or moderate. So here we have definite quantitative uh, measurements wherein we can very, very clearly, we can tell that this patient is having mild uh, MR. But then here the word of caution is because we need to keep the, uh, uh, the uh, blood pressure. Uh, um, uh, we need to check the blood pressure. We need to look at the LV, uh, EF assessment. All these things are important. But this is just an example uh, where how we can uh, use the quantitative measure to measurements to very clearly quantify the mitral legal situation. So again, this same principle is useful in uh, this another case, the secondary MR, wherein uh, uh, the uh, uh, non-ischemic uh, uh, DCM, wherein you can see that there is a, a definite mitral regurgitation, but we cannot see very clearly the flow convergence area or even the vena contractor. It's very difficult to measure here. Uh, there is definitely more than uh, mild uh, mitral regurgitation here, but then again, there is LV dysfunction you should keep in mind. And in the four chamber view, you can see that there is some flow convergence, but not very, very uh, clear. So again, in this patient also, we can use the quantitative assessment by Doppler and uh, try to get uh, uh, the regurgitant uh, volume, the uh, effective regurgitant orifice area, so that this is easy. This becomes important in uh, the follow up of the patients. So uh, the same uh, example uh, of secondary MR, another patient with ischemic DCM, wherein you can see that there is uh, wall motion uh, abnormality here with uh, 
uh, uh, uh, dilated LA, LV, and there is a moderate, maybe a moderate uh, MR. Again, this is very, very easily, uh, it's very uh, uh, difficult to quantify only on uh, eyeballing because one may say it is moderate, one may say it is severe, but then we, when you have values, it is uh, uh, very easy to convince or uh, follow up uh, uh, the patients also. So the tips of this uh, three cases is the quantification of regurgitant volume and the fraction using the Doppler volumetric method. It can assess the MR severity very accurately, irrespective of uh, if uh, whether the MR jet is single or multiple or whether it's eccentric, central or it's non holo systolic. So for uh, everything, uh, this is the answer. And the volumetric method requires experience and can be useful when the PISA or the VENA contractor cannot be used to assess the severity. But then be aware of, of uh, the small uh, uh, measurements and we need to avoid the errors in the measurements to have an accurate uh, suspension. And this, uh, mind you, this all comes with uh, practice. It doesn't happen only when you do the uh, uh, quantitative assessment in a patient who is having uh, uh, mitral regurgitation. So my take here is Please practice whenever you're doing, even in maybe some 10, 15 patients, mild MR or moderate MR or severe MR, you do practice and then you will uh, 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 be able to do it uh, more justice when the actual patient needs these quantification methods. So my uh, next case is uh, a patient who is uh, a 67-year-old, uh, shortness of breath for only two days. She's a known case of mitral oil disease, has uh, hypertension, has... Uh, Palpitations. Uh, his uh, uh, he's in AF with a uh, heart rate of 96, blood pressure of 110 by 70. So this is transthoracic uh, echo images here. Very clearly, you can see that there is some pathology in the mitral valve here. Maybe a, a, a significant prolapse or a flare leaflet uh, here. You can see there is a very significant MR eccentric jet. You can see. In the four chamber view, again, there is a significant uh, 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 eccentric jet. But then here with this uh, eccentric jet, uh, or the problem with all the eccentric jets is you usually underestimate the severity of mitral regurgitation. And it becomes very, very crucial to uh, make an accurate diagnosis, especially if it is an acute MR. Uh, and uh, also the continuous wave Doppler will not help us here because uh, of the eccentricity of the jet. So uh, uh, in this patient, uh, there was eccentric jet due to the flail PML. The MR severity assessment uh, was underestimated with the color jet area. The PISA and VINA contractor is very difficult to assess. Continuous wave Doppler is difficult to measure. The volumetric quantification of LVOT and mitral wire stroke volume is difficult here due to the presence of atrial fibrillation. And uh, the LA and LV are dilated with depressed LV function. So uh, uh, this patient is having a pre-existing mitral valve disease and it has worsened now. So we decided to proceed with trans-esophageal echo. Very clearly, the trans-esophageal echo, uh, it showed a flail uh, PML uh, segment. And uh, to evaluate this further, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Hadeep has already spoken on the role of 3D echo. I will not go into the details of 3D echo. So uh, we can evaluate and see which uh, scallop is uh, prolapsing and then probably this patient uh, uh, can be evaluated uh, more uh, nicely with the 3D wherein we can probably look at the, the vena contractor area, the 3D vena contractor area also. Uh, but here, uh, uh, again, uh, in the, the pulmonary vein, uh, uh, systolic flow reversal very clearly demonstrated, which definitely tells that this is a severe uh, mitral regurgitation. So the T confirmed a flail P2 scallop with eccentric uh, MR. The systolic flow reversing in pulmonary vein is suggestive of severe MR. The eccentric MR in AF is difficult to quantify. So the quantification also uh, made uh, difficult by color and volumetric methods. And uh, in these patients, uh, uh, the 3DT and even cardiac MR will help in accurately assessing the severity and the pathology. <clears throat> and this patient successfully underwent a mitral valve repair with good outcome. So uh, on the same lines, you can see that uh, uh, a patient uh, post PTCA has uh, landed up with acute pulmonary edema. Here you can very clearly see that there is a papillary muscle rupture here, uh, the free segment, and then there is a very uh, a flail uh, segment. Uh, patient is very tachycardic, he's in pulmonary edema. There is severe uh, uh, mitral regurgitation, but we are not able to see very clearly on the color Doppler. So again, a patient, when th these sort of patients come uh, with acute MR, we need to be uh, careful and then not, not spend too much of time in assessing the severity of MR. Again, 
the uh, anatomic imaging of the fly leaflet or ruptured papillary muscle and the finding of a hyperdynamic LV with a low Doppler systemic output along with the clinical findings should be enough to substantiate the diagnosis even if color Doppler does not show a large MR gel. And the Doppler methods, mind you, the Doppler methods for assessing the MR severity, they apply only to the chronic MR and not to the acute severe MR. And so this was my um, uh, uh, take for uh, these uh, cases of mitral regurgitation. So uh, my take home uh, message will be you to be aware of the differences in assessing the MR severity in both the primary and the secondary MR very clearly uh, the uh, flow charts given here. So we need to define the leaflet motion either by 2D trans thoracic or trans esophageal echo or take the help of a tra 3D trans uh, uh, esophageal echo define whether it is a normal leaflet or a perhaps or a player leaflet or whether it's a type 3 that's restricted uh, in both systole and diastole or a type 3B with this restricted in systole only. And then we can again look at the abnormal leaflet morphology and see if there is the fitting into secondary MR or primary MR. So the primary MR is generally e easier to evaluate because of the morphological abnormalities of the mitral leaflets and the cordae, whereas secondary MR is more difficult to grade because of the morphological abnormalities of the leaflets and cordae are absent. So you need to be very systematic in uh, evaluating these uh, mitral regurgitation by either by semi-quantitative or quantitative methods. So a comprehensive trans thoracic echo study is uh, uh, recommended and multiple parameters have to be evaluated and integrated to form a final determination of the MR severity. We can look at the valve morphology. Don't forget to look at the regurgitant color flow, the vena contracta width, PISA whenever possible. And then if these are not possible, always do a flow quantification by the pulse wave method and the jet profile. Uh, looking at the jet profile, whether it's early systolic, mid systolic or late systolic, and uh, uh, very closely look at the mitral E velocity and the A velocity, the pulmonary flow, vein flow. Don't forget to uh, record this because most of us uh, forget to record this. And if you're doing it in a systematic way, it's easier. And obviously, uh, don't forget to quantify the LA and the LB uh, volume and the size. So remember, no single echocardiographic parameter has the measurement precision to uh, or reproducibility to serve as a sole arbiter of MR severity. And mind you, MR severity is notoriously dynamic. So don't forget to record the systemic blood pressure and the heart rhythm during uh, your each echo uh, study. And uh, also look at the LV size and function, LA size and volume, and also uh, mention your pulmonary artery pressure. I think I'll end here. You can take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bora. And it has uh, both the presentations for, I would say, they, they were of good quality, high quality presentations and uh, really explained things. And this, uh, particularly the matrix bank uh, assessment, either on D or on trans specific, is indeed very important. Uh, I would just say one thing that uh, for all the viewers, it is very important to assess the matrix proper, uh, properly, and we need to spend time. Basically, all these things they require time because if they are particularly a very heavy lab, it, uh, the time is uh, not there, but still, in patients, where it is very important. It is very important that we should spend time to assess a mitral band. Because I've seen that uh, it really breaks uh, or breaks the whole thing. But if you have a severe mitral presentation, unable to see it properly, you should uh, take different uh, 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 different methods to really see that which were, that it's a severe mitral presentation or not. Because uh, uh, taking care of that mitral presentation surgically. Or by the or whatever, it, it really makes a hell of a lot of difference because the patient is not coming out despite doing all the medical maneuvers, all the medical measures, but still the patient is not coming out because we are really dealing with the severe mitral. Now, one thing that uh, uh, no doubt uh, uh, scallops should be spread on grass uh, is here at also, and uh, the, at different angles you can see the scallop, but no doubt the in phase view of the 3D echo. Uh, 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 um, the amount of effort you have to put in on a trans to see the scallops that's not required on a 3D, and you can see the end phase and becomes much easier. Uh, quantitative assessment, I think so, it is largely done on a 2D echo or a trans echo, or 3D echo. You can also do a quantitative assessment of the material position because you avoid it. So, these are the points I just wanted to make. Uh, any more points, Dr. Sidney, you want yeah, uh, Sunil, uh, excellent presentation and uh, good uh, showcase of the cases. Uh, I think uh, 
the main message today is that uh, the kind of reports we get in the periphery regarding MR, they are like you know, one plus, two plus, three plus, and you really feel bad. So I think uh, the main purpose or motive should be that assessment of microbial regurgitation. We should be using semi-quantitative methods. We have to start reporting it. LV volumes, LA volumes, LA volume index, and you should give a detailed report because with the availability of mitral valve repair with intervention, now our responsibility is even more as a non-invasive cardiologist that proper information, whether repair is possible or patient really needs surgery, all this information should be given in a report. And I think for teaching also, uh, as a academy, uh, we should uh, try and make some templates for reporting uh, the usual templates, like a patient, if a patient has LV dysfunction, we should have a template. If a patient, if we are reporting a case, patient of mitral regurgitation, we should have a template, especially if it's a primary MR, secondary MR, and all the quantitative parameters, we should start reporting in our echo reports so that the person or the surgeon or the interventionist who's receiving it should get a detailed report of what uh, anatomical uh, uh, diagnosis is there for the patient and what kind of treatment strategy they have to report. And it's very, very important that after a good 2D echo uh, color doctor evaluation, if we are still not able to decide what is the etiology of mitral regurgitation, we should offer them transesophageal echo. And especially if you have 3D transesophageal echo, you should uh, do a detailed evaluation and then try to reach to a conclusion or onto the etiological diagnosis of the patient so that proper treatment can be offered. Yeah, definitely. We can take any questions if there are. I'm trying to find out. I think so. That uh, it is nine, and uh, if there are any questions, uh, uh, Dr. Simi, uh, where would the questions appear? They have to be with the YouTube thing, but I cannot find the chat box. I think so. That uh, the, the time allotted for, for one hour from eight to nine. I believe that I think so. We can close the meeting. Yeah, the members who are attended, they can uh, pass on their questions. Uh, to uh, uh, the academy, and then we can try to answer later also offline. Yeah, they can actually post it in the YouTube chat box. The information which is available below the YouTube. Uh, uh, Doctor Sunil, would you like uh, to confirm? The that there are there are messages in the chat box regarding yeah, the recommendation regarding uh, the grading of uh, severity of secondary MR. Uh, do we use the same cutoff for EROA, regurgitant volume, and regurgitant fraction? Uh, yeah, we can use uh, the same, uh, but then for the, the, the latest guidelines, the, uh, the 2017 uh, guidelines, uh, they very clearly uh, said that the lower cutoff is uh, 20 millimeters. I agree with that. Uh, so, uh, and uh, for the second PMR, again, there is the more detailed assessment which is required, especially if the patient is going for. Uh, uh, say a mitra clip or uh, any mitral valve repair. Uh, so the secondary amount actually I did not uh, 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 present here because it was uh, uh, out of the scope of uh, this uh, topic where in secondary MR uh, we look at the more further evaluation like the tenting area, the tenting uh, distance, everything. So it was a very detailed uh, 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 out of scope of this uh, talk so I have not covered it. But then secondary MR needs more detailed evaluation and uh, more uh, parameters have to be taken. I think uh, Dr. Hardeep had told uh, that in her talk. Uh, I think we should uh, look at uh, more uh, 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 things when we are looking at secondary MR. There is another. I think. Uh, yeah, Hardeep. I think in uh, secondary MR, I believe that uh, the parameters like. ERO, uh, they may not be that um, uh, informative. I think regurgitant uh, volume, uh, reg sorry, regurgitant fraction is very important uh, in secondary MR because no, regurgitant fraction... Yeah, regression volume and ERO may be low, but I think regression fraction would give us a very good idea that how much blood is regurgitating back into the um, uh, LA. Uh, 
that is yeah. basically because uh, the vena contracta area is not very circular and it is more elliptical and then uh, the 3d te will help us in uh, more accurately assessing the vena contracta area so there uh, in the secondary mr we need to do that uh, there is yeah, another and, question uh, and second, uh, in secondary mr particularly i think so 3d te because assumptions are not there in 3d that's a, that that is the best part of it in 2D, yes. you are all the time making assumptions that it is hemispherical. For PISA, you are thinking that it is hemispherical, but it may, it may not be hemispherical at all. It may be elliptical. So you are just making assumptions on 2D. In 3D, I think so things are more clear. But I think so the learning curve for doing all the assessments on the 3D is still has, it still has to come. We are more conversant with 2D assessments still date. And but uh, definitely, as I am saying, that assumptions being not there, so 3D would definitely be a better one to uh, to quantify. Yes, sir. There's another yes. question in the chat box. Uh, how commonly you do 3D vena contracta area for quantification of MR? Hardeep, would you like to answer? It? Um, see, uh, as far as the my, I mean, in my experience, as far as the mitral pathology is concerned, uh, we use 3D zoom which is easier to use. But when we need to do mitral valve quantification in terms of mitral regurgitation and everything, we need to uh, take a full volume uh, 3D data set. And sometimes taking a full volume a 3D data set becomes very difficult because to have a good resolution for a full volume uh, data set, you need to do multi-beat accusation, and which may not be possible when you are doing a T or when you are, you know, doing T during a structural heart intervention because you have to ask the patient to hold his breath. So sometimes it becomes very difficult. So in my experience, um, quantification is sometimes be becomes very challenging because you have to take full volume and then because of the stitch artifacts and everything, uh, the image quality may not be very good. Yeah. yeah particularly for the so there's another question which has come up that is how to assess diastolic mitral regurgitation. So Neil, would you like to comment on this? Uh, diastolic mitral regurgitation, again, you need to more depend on uh, the continuous wave Doppler uh, assessment, what you're doing. But apart from that, there's no quantification directly, which I am aware of diastolic mitral regurgitation. And uh, I am not able to recall anything on uh, the assessment uh, of that. So uh, the continuous wave Doppler should help us in assessing that. And then more importantly, I uh, am sure no, most of the echocardiographers don't use ECG. So this is a learning curve wherein you should uh, record your images with the ECG gated. Uh, you want to add anything, uh, uh, Hardeep, or maybe- I think so, uh, that diastolic mitral regurgitation in particular would be the, it is there or not. I think so that's all what you can know. That's yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think I think even that is the only thing which is important because I don't think you will get a severe diastolic MR. So diastolic MR is generally an uh, generally a consequence of other things like AV blocks or maybe you know AR, all those things, high LV DP. I think so I would so uh, still that uh, ECG record because of heavy workload and on the labs, you tend to avoid putting ECGs there. And uh, That's I what think I mean. it should be a practice. And uh, uh, without ECGs, I don't think so that we should accept uh, presentations. No, uh, I feel it is a crime uh, doing uh, echo without ECG gating. And this, is, this should be uh, clear to all the sonographers or the echocardiographers. It hardly takes a few seconds to connect the ECG. And there are a lot of other like jugards. What we can do if uh, cost is a constraint, we can do a lot of jugards wherein we can use the ECG, the, the clips. What is there? I don't think so. That uh, one, one important thing about the diastolic MR is that any amount of diastolic MR is abnormal. So uh, it has to be yeah. taken in view. Another question is uh, that uh, uh, what is your take on uh, the guidelines for multiple jet MR in assessment of severity? Okay, so uh, the multiple jet uh, again, you you should uh, use uh, the uh, the flow quantification by pulse wave Doppler. I think that is uh, the norm. And uh, again, here your PISA uh, will not be useful. The vena contractor will be not useful. Maybe three D and uh, the cardiac MRI is uh, another option if uh, uh, you're not able to really quantify the multiple jet MR. 
but then go step by step if uh, you don't have uh, the facility to do a T or a 3D T or a Kade Kamar, just rely on your uh, flow quantification by uh, uh, the Doppler echocardiography. That is the gold standard, I feel. So uh, that one is a uh, thing. And uh, yeah, definitely any diastolic MR is abnormal. So we can't quantify it that it is severe, mild or rare. If any diastolic MR is there, it is it means it is an abnormal finding. I don't think so. There are any more questions now. Uh, I think some more questions can be put directly to the speakers too. Yeah, I think they can post it on the YouTube channel only. And we can reach out can post it on the YouTube and you can accordingly you can you can answer them back. I think that's a good idea. So I, I believe that we will close the session now. And uh, 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 and thanks to Dr. Hardeep and uh, Dr. Sunil for wonderful and very enlightening presentations. Uh, uh, so good night to you. And I'll, 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 I'll close the meeting. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Indian Academy. Thank you. I hope it was all a, a very you. wonderful meeting. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.